Hi, everyone, and welcome to Seek Sustainable Japan podcast. I hope you're having a great day.、Uh, this is a short 30 minute episode between me, JJ Walsh, here in Hiroshima, and Tova Kinooka, who is a sustainability focused consultant and leadership trainer in, based in Yokohama, Japan. So, both of us are sustainability focused entrepreneurs. We're on either side of Japan doing various things. And this is part of our monthly series. We get together and we talk about sustainable related events and issues and innovation and strategies and products which have been on our radar、uh, during the month. So I hope you enjoy the episode. As always, please subscribe, share, like, and、uh, write your comments and questions below. We'd love to get back to you. Have a great day. I'm JJ Walsh here in Hiroshima, Japan, and joined by. Hi, I'm Tova Kinooka, and I'm in Yokohama, Japan. And we are both sustainability focused consultants、uh, doing various kinds of work.、Uh, today, we're talking about travel and business and、uh, sustainability and issues to think about. And、uh, recently, I went to Hida Takayama. Have you ever been there? No, where no. is that? Oh my gosh, it's a beautiful area. I had a consulting job in rural Gifu.、Um, so it was a good chance to go and visit this beautiful area. So, this is Hida Furukawa.、Uh, Hida Takayama is just a gorgeous old、uh, like townscape and cityscape. They have so much local sake breweries,、um, they have hidden the wires in the main townscape. Um, so, they're really preserving the old buildings. There's a lot of new guest houses, which are in renovated old, old buildings. It's absolutely gorgeous. And、uh, of course, the area is also famous for its beef industry. And as someone seeking vegetarian vegan options, it was a little bit of a challenge, but I did find two fantastic places. And one of them, Uh, is run by this couple and they make vegan Chinese food. Oh, wow. And I'll, I'll put all the links below in the, in the show notes. And they only do it by reservation.、Um, they said they started making the vegan Chinese food because of the tourism demand and the fact that there was so little vegetarian vegan available in that town. I was so impressed by everything they're doing.、Uh, they're making all the recipes from scratch and everything.、Uh, things that are really difficult to find、uh, vegan options for in Chinese food in Japan. Mabo dofu here.、Uh, we had miso ramen.、Um, just beautiful, wonderful options. We also found another place called Evil Tex. <laughs> <laughs> Which I absolutely love. The design and the logo is so fun. And this is not like healthy food at all. This is <laughs> comfort food at its best. It was awesome.、Uh, they said they had a local jet who was a vegetarian who couldn't eat anything. And so、mm. they developed this awesome vegan burger from、huh. scratch, from lentils and,、uh, or soybeans. And it was、mm. so tasty. And they were just about to go to America. And do a burger place tour and try out all the veggie and vegan burgers and then bring back those recipes to Japan.、Oh, so、it was really、yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Yeah.、Uh, the area is really famous for all the thatch roof houses.、Uh, mm-hmm. You can go visit、uh, some of them, UNESCO World Heritage. And、uh, yeah, just fantastic area to explore and, and lots of great insights. Now, we stayed at a hotel which I thought was above par in terms of sustainability.、Um, they had everything was plastic free in the room,、uh, no plastic amenities.、Uh, this mineral water in a recyclable aluminum can. Thank、yep. you, Itoen. It's nice to see <laughs> new companies getting in the bottled water game,、uh, not plastic. And outside the onsen, also, it looks like a typical vending machine. But at the bottom, you can see the reusable Coke bottles, which are so、ah, hard to find.、Yeah. So that、yeah. is another point of appeal.、Mm-hmm. Toothbrushes, wooden toothbrush, and then the toothpaste in a packet. 
<laughs> um, so lots of these small things that usually uh, you would only see in plastic, even the coffee bag. Uh, they had a dip style coffee, so it was more like a tea bag hmm. to get rid of any of the plastic that usually is on top of the drip, the yeah. drip bags. And I, I did a little um, search about Accor. So it's run by the Accor uh, group. Mm -hmm. And they have a lot of great sustainability concepts in place. And then that led me to look at booking.com. Um, they're listed, this Mercure uh, hotel was listed as having travel sustainable measures, which is great to see. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think my standards are pretty high. And so when, I, when I'm impressed by everything I see, uh, a lot of less plastic, a lot of reusables, it, it really did impress me. And yeah. they're also featuring the local woodworking for mm -hmm. the Nakayama area. So also uh, highlighting the local culture, the local traditions is always really great to see. Yeah, yeah, very much so, yeah. All right. Uh, do you want to introduce Women in Tech? There's an event coming up tomorrow. Right. Yes. Yeah. So um, the Women in Tech uh, is a global organization um, started in Paris um, and they are launching their Japan chapter. As you can see, they've got an event in uh, Kyoto tomorrow, the 29th of June, and then in Tokyo on the 5th of July. Um, it's limited spaces, but um, open to the public. So um, please look at that link if you're interested. Um, so I'm going to be moderating one of the panels in the, the Tokyo session and uh, looking at, at gender diversity in the, the tech industry, um, which, as everyone's um, I'm sure aware is, is, you know, not the most gender diverse industry right now. Um, and it's sort of interesting timing with the, the recent um, sort of latest report coming out of um, WEF with the, you know, the gender equality rankings and seeing Japan going down to 125th. Um, really disappointing to see that slide. Um, and, you know, although Japan has more <laughs> qualified and educated women than men, actually, so it, it's, you know, interesting to see where that disparity starts to kick in and how sort of sort of girls, women are, are sort of pushed towards particular paths, um, uh, which makes it very hard for then the tech industry to, to find um, female talent with the right skill set and background. So we'll be exploring that. Um, but I'm sure women in tech are going to be doing a lot more here in Japan. So even if you can't make the launch, follow them, look at what's going on, because uh, they'll be driving change in this area. That's awesome. Awesome to see. Uh, another thing I wanted to highlight was uh, Heather Fukase, who's an organic farmer in Nagano. And if you like rhubarb and you're oh, in Japan, oh, she oh. has rhubarb, organic rice, organic rhubarb, organic wheat, white flour oh. and wholemeal flour. Uh, so I would definitely uh, recommend ordering from Heather. Uh, when I got my rice, it came in a paper bag, uh, which was awesome as yeah. well. So plastic free. Yeah. She's, yeah. she's an awesome organic farmer. Good to support. But yeah, rhubarb crumble. <gasps> awesome. <laughs> You're making me hungry now. <laughs> now you were at a special dinner. Tell us about the King's lunch, was it? King's birthday party. So um, for, well, every year um, the UK obviously has the, the, used to be the Queen's birthday party. Now it's the King's birthday party. So the British Embassy in Tokyo hosts a big event. There were about 700 people there. And the picture you're looking at there is uh, vegan sushi which was wonderful. So the King, King Charles III is, uh, always has been um, throughout his life a very, very strong advocate for sustainability, for organic food and farming and um, regenerative farming um, practices. So whatever you think of the, the monarchy, you know, he's, he's genuinely passionate and um, committed to that. And so the embassy in running this um, approached us a few months back, say, could we consult um, for the sustainability of the event? They really wanted to make sure it was integrated into everything, not just the food, but thinking about the entertainment um, they were putting on, the, the you know, the energy, um, how were they serving the food, for example, so that the sushi was served in sort of bamboo um, little plates. I'm not sure you can see it there. It was just to the, the right. But um, uh, so really thinking about 
sort of the the, the overall picture. Um, and they also used it as an opportunity to highlight um, the carbon footprint of different kinds of food. Um, and how the, the different production methods can really impact that. So it was interesting to look at. You can see there, you know, you've got the carbon footprint by diet type, which I think a lot of people are already aware of. Um, but the the lamb one there, you can see, you know, global average would be sort of 39 um sort of CO2 per, per kilogram emissions. But looking at Welsh lamb, the way it's produced, um, less intensive, grass-fed, for example, that brings it down to 12. So not all food is the same, whether you're talking about vegetables or meat. The way it's produced, where it's produced, how it's transported, all of these things need to be factored in when you're considering you know, how sustainable a particular option is. Um, so it was a, a great opportunity to highlight that. And they had um, sort of displays around looking at sort of comparing different types of, of food and the impact of that. So um, and the, the sushi was amazing. So, you know, didn't oh miss. Oh, my gosh, it looks so good. <laughs> it was. I, I want to eat that. Uh, please, all sushi <laughs> places around Japan, can you please start serving this kind of vegan sushi? I love it. Yeah. <laughs> amazing. Love it. Um, but mm. that, you know, that was one of the things on the booking.com list. Mm. Uh, they talk about nature. Yeah. Wild, non-domesticated animals are not displayed, interacted with, or sold as harvested, consumed. Mm. And this is an issue I think we often talk about in Japan for more sustainable meat would be the wild meat yeah. because there is... Uh, too many wild boar, there's too many deer. So the government is trying to encourage people to hunt or trap yeah. and eat that meat. And I always think of wild meat as more sustainable. So I was confused by why Booking.com mm -hmm. would have this uh, as the sustainable part. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's interesting. Isn't it? I think there are a lot of kind of misconceptions, misunderstandings around sustainability and food, um, and particularly around sort of meat um, and meat alternatives. We hear a lot um, of stuff about them where, you know, sort of people would assume that because it's not real meat that it, it's more sustainable. But then you look at the impact of monoculture crops, um, for example, soy, and, and the impact that can have if it's grown in a way that's not sustainable. And then all the processing as well in a lot of these sort of alternative meats can actually have a really negative impact. So it, again, holistically looking at the big picture, these things need to be better understood, but also more clearly labeled, I think, in food. And there needs to, you know, regulation needs to be driving that behind. Um, but so but that, that said, overall, uh, eating soy, you yeah. are so much less water usage, so much less pollution, so much less negative carbon impact overall, because what are we feeding the cattle? What are we feeding the kids, uh, the pigs and other livestock? Yeah. You're also feeding them soy. Yeah. So yeah. You, you've got that plus the added pollution plus the added energy yeah. and yeah. Uh, and carbon. So it, it yeah. is always more sustainable to have a sustainable plant-based diet whenever you can. And this is somewhere that I think tourism can really help. Mm -hmm. Even if you end up eating fish or meat, if you're asking for the vegan vegetarian option yeah. and thinking yeah. of most of your meals in Japan as choosing vegetarian, vegan, if there is available, that really helps because one of the problems we're seeing in Japan now is the government is trying to push up the production of meat. And that has a much more damaging water intensive and creating pollution problems. Yeah. Uh, this yeah. is from Japan's own government talking about uh, the problems with livestock related environmental issues in Japan. And this was from 2017. So you see dairy cattle, beef cattle, pigs being mm. the top three emitters of pollution and odor complaints. All hmm. odor complaints in Japan, 10% comes from the livestock industry. <laughs> so I think, you know, right. we, we're always like in tourism, they're always promoting Wagyu or locally. Mm locally grown beef or or pork mm. um but that's it might be connected to culture it might be connected to appeal but it's not a sustainable uh diet 
choice, right? right? So right. that's good yeah. to keep in mind. Uh, not not every meal, right? Please, not every meal. meal. Yep. <laughs> exactly. all, all about balance, right? You know, all as so many of these things are making informed choices and uh, considering the overall balance, I think is massively yeah. important. Absolutely. Um, so let's talk about your uh, lab, your upcoming lab. Right. So the Sustainability Leadership Lab is our, our first ever um, B2C program. So usually we work with corporates. This is um, direct open to uh, individuals. Um, they may be sponsored by their company, but um, you're free to uh, sign up um, on your own uh, sort of initiative as well. And this is a six month program. Um, initially, we were thinking we'd do it hybrid, but now uh, we, we've decided to go fully online so that it's available to, to more people. Um, and we've got six modules over six months. And the idea is that we've got a uh, small cohort so that they're learning from each other. And it's really about the, the people side of sustainability, the challenges that um, people in sustainability roles face um, relating to how they're engaging, how they're communicating. So you can see here, we've got um, a really brilliant lineup of speakers. Um, some of them based in Japan, two based in the UK, one based in Korea, um, all with an amazing background and, and track record of really delivering on sustainability. And you can see some of the organizations there. We've got, you know, SK Group in Korea, IKEA, um, uh, Mark Haviland, who was uh, formerly the global head of sustainability for Rakuten, now with Marine Conservation Society, um, Lixil, you know, th these are companies that really are leading the charge on sustainability. And we're looking really at how are you engaging with different stakeholders in your organization? Um, all the participants will take on a, a project throughout as well so that they sort of finish the program with uh, a tangible plan to take away and go and put into action. And so the idea is that it really um, overcomes a lot of those people-related challenges around mindsets, behaviors that block sustainability strategies from working in organizations. So really looking forward to that um, starting in September. So if you want to sign up, there are still places available. Please um, do that ASAP. That sounds amazing. Like a great opportunity to really just up your level of understanding and get so many insights from these experts. This is a really amazing panel of speakers you've got. Yeah, we're, we're very lucky to, to have all of them on board and very uh, grateful for them. They're all busy people, so really appreciate their time. But I think also one thing we've found is a lot of people working in sustainability roles in organizations feel very isolated. You know, they're there in the sustainability team or committee or whatever it is, depending on the organization. Um, and they're trying to get things moving. They get stuck. They're not quite sure why things won't, you know, get better traction in the company. But who do they talk to about that? So by sort of having this, this peer cohort from different organizations, the idea is that they can share learnings, challenges with each other, help each other to, to overcome that, as well as working with obviously the, you know, the facilitator and coach and the guest speakers as well, having access to them. So uh, we're hoping it will be a, a really valuable and, and enjoyable experience. That's awesome. Um, I had some interesting talks this month with uh, people around Japan and even internationally. Um, one was a Fukushima-based Dutch person uh, named Joost, Joost Kralt. Sorry if I made a mistake there, Joost. Um, and he's doing a really interesting food camp uh, hmm. in the Fukushima area. And they're, doing, they're taking people, they're picking them up in the city centers near the stations, they're taking them out to the farms where the food is grown, and they're bringing amazing chefs from the area, and then serving the food out there on location in these beautiful rural farms. And they just added a hydrogen food truck to their <laughs> fleet. So now emissions free. Uh, very interesting because uh, from a consumer perspective, uh, people enjoy the food more because there's no smell of diesel. Uh, there's <laughs> no sound of the engine, right? So mm -hmm. he was he was doing the interview from the truck. It was super quiet. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, really cool. 
Yeah, uh, also, too. yeah. Also, mm -hmm. to to bring more appeal to the Fukushima area, it's just fantastic to see. There is uh, such great uh, agriculture there, mm -hmm. and you know they're very active in testing everything. I did yep. a, a trip up at the beginning of the year. And uh, it might be safer than other parts of the world because they are testing. Exactly. It's being monitored actively. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. I also talked uh, to a lady, Kelly Hayes Riot, right? And she calls herself the house, house sit diva. So she has traveled around the world house sitting and pet sitting mm. as a way to do sustainable slow travel. And she was in politics in the States. Uh, she is very active and like uh, passion led in volunteering. And uh, while she was doing these house sits and staying for a long time in places, uh, she was actually reporting back to American newspapers about the local situation, uh, about refugees, about uh, different social issues that she saw. So she was using it as a way to do really sustainable, slow, meaningful travel. Uh, yeah. So that was that was really interesting talking with her. Mm -hmm. And then just a few days ago, uh, talking with a local translator interpreter named Rachel Nicholson. And uh, she's been here in Hiroshima for 16 years. And uh, she ran a shokudo. She ran her own cafe. Uh, she's really into coffee. She was talking about local Hiroshima coffee places. And she's a real foodie. So that, that was really <laughs> fun. There's a... Yeah you know, back to all the sustain, more sustainable choices that you can make, uh, including coffee. There is, you mm. know, a lot of issues with coffee yes. grown in other locations. And is it fair for the growers? Uh, is it fair trade? It, you know, there is very little of that kind of awareness mm. uh, in Japan, but we certainly have some that are really thinking about it. So that's great yeah. to talk yeah. about. Well, that's good to hear. Yeah. Now you had... Uh, another topic. Uh, here we go. Corporate Action Japan. Can you tell us about this? Right. So yesterday um, we had lunch with the, the CEO of Corporate Action Japan, who we've known for a long time in his former role, um, Yasunori Takeuchi. So he was head of Standard Chartered Bank for many years and he retired thought he'd retire quietly um, and was then approached to run this organization. Um, he, he personally is very passionate about uh, climate and, and you know, addressing climate change. And this is an MPO um, and they, he's launched the Japan chapter. And their purpose is to, as you can see, accelerate action, uh, climate action, driving it um, through real sort of uh, pressure from the top, through consulting, um, sort of activist consulting almost. So he and his team go and talk to um, the, the CEOs, the senior directors of, you know, all these very large companies that have a huge impact. And they're particularly focusing to begin with on the industry um, around construction that are really, really hard to decarbonize. Um, and he said it was interesting that, you know, you go and talk to them and you look at the website and it says, yes, yes, we're going to be, you know, zero carbon by, you know, this date or whatever. But there's no plan underneath that, actually. There, there are goals, there are ambitions, but there's no solid roadmap underneath. So what he is doing um, with this organization is helping companies Firstly, sort of make more ambitious uh, targets, um, bringing the dates forward, um, upping their, you know, the um, the level of change that they want to achieve, but then really helping them understand that they need a solid roadmap underneath that and looking at how do they get started on that and um, engaging with different stakeholders. So he's sitting down with top levels of government, um, large organizations, connecting them also with environmental um, MPOs and activists and things. So really kind of bringing together different stakeholders. So very much around the sort of public-private partnerships, which in Japan hasn't been sort of a very sort of well-used tool, if you like. In, in Europe, um, organizations, companies, businesses have, have been interacting for a long time already with NPOs, for example, um, to actually work with them. So it often starts with there's an issue that the NPO will flag and say, guys, you're not doing well on this. You need to up your game or you know, there'll be trouble. And so starting from that point, but actually using the 
the depth of expertise that a lot of the MPOs have to help the companies understand, well, how do we do this better then? How do we um, you know, get a stronger understanding of the complexity in our supply chain and, and how to work with you know, smallholders or you know, little SMEs in the, the supply chain that really struggle to change, but the, the big companies can you know, a part of that and can support them. So I think what he's doing is very much needed here, particularly, um, and it's great. I mean, it's early days. He's building a team. He's got eight people so far, four women, four men. He's been very conscious of of building the gender diversity of his team, Um, one non-Japanese, all fully bilingual, though. Um, So he's really working hard on bringing different stakeholders together and driving change and the level of ambition here. So I'm really excited to see sort of what more they achieve going forward. That's awesome. That sounds really good. Uh, It's so wonderful to hear uh, these passionate people moving forward with positive change. I think it makes such a big difference. Um, I I recently wrote an article which was published this month uh, on All About Japan about Onomichi, Mm -hmm. and how uh, this is a small town in Hiroshima, but how they are really turning things around. There's so much problems uh, in rural areas around Japan in terms of having enough population there, for one thing, a lot of people moving away, Um, but so much innovation and entrepreneurship, a lot of it, well, I'm always focused on sustainability. Um, Mm -hmm. So all of my uh, places that I chose are really going above and beyond in terms of sustainable innovation and strategy and really creating such a sustainable destination in Japan. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I had such a great response from um, some of my old students from university who I taught tourism and business to. Uh, most of my career and one of them got in touch and she said she's working in Onomichi and her boss sent my article to everybody and said you have to read this this is amazing this is about sustainable Onomichi we want to be like this and I was like yay you know (laughs) what a great result yeah that's that's impact right that's real impact yeah yeah and the the part two is coming out soon uh which focuses on more entrepreneurs Uh, who are doing really innovative things right nearby. Now, one of the really exciting things, I think, is you have a combination of people who have done a U-turn, who (laughs) were originally from Onomichi. They went abroad, they went to other parts of Japan, and they came back. Yeah. And you have a lot of people who are from other areas, but they visited Onomichi. Maybe they did the Shimanami Kaido. They got really inspired by the vibe. A lot of them mentioned the vibe that they <laughs> feel um, and the beautiful views and the support of all the other sustainably led entrepreneurs. And so that's somewhere they wanted to be. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, really exciting to be able that's, to introduce yeah. such a great example. Yeah, and it, it's really nice to hear examples like that of, like you say, sort of people going away, but then recognizing the value of what they had and, and going back to that. And then that also drawing in other people. And I think a lot of other rural areas that are struggling could learn from that, right? It, it's a very different quality of life. And if you can sort of enable people to to see that, to experience that, um, then it is attractive, actually. Yeah. And uh, mm-hmm. I, a few people responded on, on Twitter to the article and like, oh, no, I better hurry. I've been thinking of buying a place and moving to Onomichi. <laughs> oh, no, now <laughs> it's going to be too busy. <laughs> but don't worry, <laughs> there's still lots of empty places. Move it so there's still room. There's still room yeah. to grow. Yeah, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> That's good um, was there, we've got a few more minutes. Oh, just two more minutes. Any, uh, we had a comment from Greg. Uh, Greg Friston, nice to see you. Interesting question to resolve. No better people to identify a resolution for us, I'm sure. So I think talking about uh, hotel sustainability from the beginning. Great. Mm. You could join us, Greg. Uh, Any other things on your radar there, Tova? So one more thing I wanted to mention was, um, again, thinking of rural areas doing interesting things, the Atlantic Pacific um, summer camp uh, for young leaders is in um, happening end of July, is it, or August? Um, 
got the link there. There you go, 31st of July to 4th of August. So this is for young leaders, sort of high school age um, or early university years. It's in Kamaishi, Nebama Bay, Kamaishi. Um, I think I mentioned before, talked about the spring camp that I attended back in March. So now they've got their summer camp happening. And it's a beautiful example of um, a local area that was, well, it was decimated during the, the 2011 tsunami. They've really worked hard to rebuild not just the, the physical town, but the, the community there and to build, think about the future and, and how can they attract people to come here to, to visit, to come and live and want to stay there. The people that, you know, the young ones that they won't want to, to leave it forever. Um, and th this camp is a, a brilliant example of that. So kids come from all over the world um, they will be looking at local uh, issues such as plastic pollution in the ocean um, they've got fishing experience uh, life saving and things which is you know where Atlantic Pacific uh, started and so brilliant experience for the kids there's a lot um, of interaction with local communities local groups um, and, you know, they, they also meet kids from all over Japan and all over the world as well. So, I mean, it's a really interesting, inspire, inspiring, but also sort of fun experience. They'll learn a lot from it. So if you're looking for something for your, your teenagers to do, um, that would be a really beneficial and fun experience. Would really highly recommend this. And it helps the Kamaishi area as well. Yeah. Kamaishi is in Tohoku, right? That's right. Yes. Yep. In, so you know, that, that in whole Europe. area is still recovering. Even 12 it years is. later, um, there's still a lot of coastal areas because of the great tsunami and then the earthquake, the earthquake tsunami and then the nuclear power yeah. um, disaster. Exactly. But a lot of places are physically still recovering from the tsunami damage. Yes. And the earthquake damage, as well as, you know, the radiation is constantly monitored. Um, I don't, I don't feel when I go up there that that's a, mm -hmm. an issue to worry about. And this looks like a wonderful experience for kids. I'm so glad you're part of that, Tova. Yeah, so I won't be at the summer camp. I was at the spring one uh, running one of the, the workshops, but uh, won't be able to do it this time. But they've got a great lineup of people, a great team. They're very, very passionate about what they do. And the local uh, teams that they work with there in Nebama Bay are amazing. And, you know, the experience they've been through of the disaster and the regeneration afterwards is it's incredible to hear. It's very powerful um, and uh, a lot of learnings, whatever you're doing in life, I think. So, yeah, highly recommend it. Awesome. Well, thank you, Sova. Thank you, everybody, for joining. That is our 30 minutes. Uh, what what topic was most interesting to you, everybody out there? Please uh, write your comments and questions below, and we will be happy to add our point of view. Uh, also, share some links with us if you have heard mm. or seen something that you think is really exciting in terms of sustainability, doing a better than the status quo. Uh, we want to know about it. So please let us know. Get in touch. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks so much, Tova. Stay cool, everybody. Getting hot out there. And uh, see you next time. See you next month. Brilliant. Thanks, JJ. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Tova. Bye. Anyone seen the guy who used to be right here? Some of us can't get over the sound of our own voices. Some of us come around just to lend an ear. Don't ever change. Just the way you are. So we're a little strange. It's all working out so far. You all seem like such nice. Has anyone ever seen a mess like this? Some of us don't mind crying in public.
some of us are just dying to be missed you all seem like such nice